Welcome. If you enjoy history and trains and a story with a positive ending, this video is going to be for you. My name is Adam Webster from 98.9 MASH Icon, and uh, there's a new film called The Nine Lives of Engine Number no. 9, presented by the Thompson, Connecticut Historical Society and the Thompson Public Library, and it's directed by Blair Cole, who is on this Zoom, a freelance producer and director who creates commercials and corporate marketing and other products. And we also have a Tom Chase, a retired Smithsonian researcher who provided a lot of the historical research for the film. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Uh, Tom, let's begin with a brief overview about engine number nine and its fascinating history in a nutshell. Well, it, 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 uh, the, the, the film is entitled The Nine Lives of Number Nine. And that's because it had a very long and checkered history it was built in 1891 by the Portland Company and uh, bought by the Sandy River Railroad. It went out and ran there for about a year and then had a big crash. And they took it back to the Portland Company and rebuilt it. And it went back to the Sandy River and it, it served for quite a while out there. And then eventually they went bankrupt and it was bought by the uh, Kennebec Central which was a little railroad that went, went from Randolph, Maine to the VA hospital in Togus, about four miles, mostly pulling, uh, co they had a coal contract for the VA hospital. And in, I think in 1933, the, uh, the coal contract went out for bid and a trucking company underbid them by $1. So the railroad folded, uh, but the Wiscasset, Waterville and Farmington needed engines. And so uh, WWF bought them and trucked them down from Randolph down to, down to Wiscasset. And uh, they both were the, the last two engines to run on the WWF. Uh, number eight, which was this, this engine's sister, ran real well. Number nine didn't run so well. So out, out they went with number eight for about a year and then it derailed and they, the railroad just gave up. It just left the engine, <laughs> engine there and went, went totally bankrupt. And so number nine was back sitting in the engine house. Uh, and it sat there for four years uh, until a, a group of rail fans, in, in, uh, Frank Ramsdell, Bill Moneypenny, and two others, uh, Moneypenny decided to put up the money to buy it. And Frank put up the farm that it could, could live on. So it moved down here. To Thompson, and Connecticut? To, to Thompson, Connecticut, yeah. And uh, it, when, when, they, when they brought it down here, it was a great cause of, of celebration for them. There's some wonderful pictures that are in the movie of people uh, climbing all over the engine as it got to the farm. But uh, and Blair, you want, do you want to carry, continue the story a little bit? Well, I'm, I'm curious to where Blair got involved. Like, how was this pitched to you to direct this film and then, you know, bring it to, to, to modern day now? Well, um, I'm related to the Ramsdells. Okay. Yeah, through uh, the Ballards. And I was aware of the train from the time I was a kid. We, I didn't, I grew up in central Massachusetts, Lemonster, Mass. But we, we came down here to the family farm. <laughs> On, on a couple of occasions, I remember my mother asking if I wanted to go see my Aunt Alice's train. And I thought she meant train set. Right. And I didn't, I didn't take her up on the offer. I never saw it when it was here. And I wished I had. So I was aware of it. And um, <clears throat> we went to um, a, uh, a dedication in all the Maine in uh, August of 2016, I think it was. Where they actually ran the train, they had it was back up there. I'm kind of giving away the whole story here, but it was back in Maine and it had been restored. And that was the first time I saw it. And the current owner, and the person who really was responsible for getting it up there, Dale King, was on the train. And I, I just brought my little GH3 camera and and filmed, and we made a short film. And after that, we started talking. Maybe we should do something more. Maybe we should do a story about the train, how it got to Thompson, what happened to it while it was here. And, and how it ended up getting back to Maine. And I think that's kind of where it started. How many years did that train sit idle in, in a shed or a garage or just untouched? 60. 60, 60 years. 60 mm -hmm. years. Yeah. Everybody knew about it. And Alice was famous for it. 
There were stories in local news in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Yankee Magazine did a story on her. Uh, the train was featured numerous times and um, people up in Maine where it had come from tracked it down. They knew it was down here, but Alice was not about to let it go. Alice was a real, a real Yankee. She is famous locally for fighting off the Army Corps of Engineers in the 60s when the entire village of West Thompson was being taken by eminent domain to build a dam to protect the Thames River Basin down around New London from flooding. There was a, a, a devastating flood in 1955. And she held off, according to legend, she held off the Army Corps of Engineers lawyers with her shotgun and said, you are not taking my farm. And she won. She won her battle and she was allowed to live on her farm that had been in her family since the 18th century for the duration of her life. But when she passed in 1994, everything was left to Dale and Dale had six months to get rid of everything. Everything had to go, including an 18 ton locomotive, a, a box car, a flat car, a tender, a third of a mile of track. What was he gonna do with it? So that's really a big part of our story because there's, I don't wanna give everything away. I'd like people to come see, but there's sure. a whole, a whole other story that was happening up in Maine that ties in, that brings these things together and, and essentially saved the train. It, it, it was threatened numerous times. And, and Tom maybe wants to talk a little bit about some of the threats it faced from 37 when it got here until the 90s when it finally was able to leave intact. Well, the, after they got it down here in 1937, I think they had, they had assumed that they could just basically just clean it up a little bit and fire it up and, and it would run. Well, they they started to get into it and found out that that would, that would not be exactly true. And uh, they, ordered, they ordered some new parts and the, then the war intervened and you, 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 know, you couldn't get steel. And in fact, there were, they were very worried that somebody was going to come in and take the engine and the rails for scrap. Wow. So they, they uh, and I think they took two different occasions and they pulled the rails out into the into the woods so nobody could find them. And the engine was in, in its own shed co closed up so you couldn't see it. And people knew it was there, but you know, the scrap drive people drove, drove couldn't see it when they drove by. So they preserved it during the war. And uh, then after the war, you know, various people came to look at it, uh, including the... Uh, the head of Edeville Railroad, who really who want, really wanted to get it up at Edeville, it's the same gauge as as the Edeville locomotives. It would have been would have fit fit right in, but Alice was having none of it. Uh, <laughs> I think I think she did not take a shine to, to F. Nelson Blount, who was the head of Edeville. But uh, we we have his name in in the guest book, and, and we knew we know he came down to look at it. And then how many engines from 1891 or the late 1800s are still in existence today? Well, there are there are a few, but there uh, are. When was the last time this engine was on tracks and moved? Oh, uh, oh, it's 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 now it's now a regular regular performer up at uh, WWNF. Oh, here I thought it was uh, in some museum, a museum piece that some people can go and look at. It's actually on. It's it's being utilized. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The Nine Lives of Engine Number Nine, creative name. I love it. The movie premiere is going to be on Saturday, August 14th. There are going to be two showings. Where is that going to be held? Uh, that, at the Thompson High School Auditorium. And the, uh, in addition to that, in the, the oldest part of the school, which is the Turtle Up Memorial part of the school, there we have the Thompson Historical Society has three rooms. The uh, treasure room, which is the collection that the turtle lots actually made, uh, and the there's the Keeney store room, which is the inside of the old store and post office that was in Mechanicsville, and there's the Ramsville transportation collection. The historical museum is housed in the high school. It sounds like, yeah, there, there, there in, are, in, in um, one of those buildings. Three, there, yeah, there, there are three museums in the old high school building, the Turtle Lot building, and then the main um, museum is in the Ellen Larned Museum, which is on Thompson Road in Thompson Center, right on Thompson Hill. And then there's also 
uh, the old town hall, which is um, um, an Ethiel town building, a famous architect. The uh, Ellen Larner Museum is, is kind of the home. And then the Turtle Lock Museum, which is 10 minutes away. Uh, there are three there, right, Tom? You've got the yep. Ramsdale train. Yeah, the Kenny oh, Kenny room, and and then the 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 treasure room. And yeah, the tre all... when you the treasure room, Adam. When he refers to that, um, the turtle lots were wealthy people who traveled to Europe and collected artwork oh, yeah. during, uh, I guess, pretty much the Gilded Era. They brought it back. Um, both their daughters passed away due to illness. And uh, Mrs. Turtlelot built this museum. They did. They donated the, the funds to build this high school to the town when there wasn't a school in town. And included in it, she built a room to display her artwork uh, as a memorial to her two daughters who had died of disease. And it's filled. It, it's incredible. It's like walking into the the um, Stuart Gardner Museum or something. But it's it's in this little town in northeastern Connecticut. I'll have the link to all of this uh, down in the description of this video. Uh, so Blair, you're gonna obviously be there to introduce uh, the movie that you directed, but people are also gonna be able to see this on PBS in uh, the coming weeks and months, and then it's going to live forever online as well, correct? Correct, yeah, it'll be on PBS, late September, early October, PBS uh, Connecticut, Maine, um, New Hampshire and Vermont, we think. We're, we're trying to get uh, through to Rhode Island. Um, the owner, of the train, Dale King, lives in Cranston, so you would think that they would be very interested. And um, we'll, we'll see what happens, but it should be available on PBS stations throughout New England, as well as online, on PBS online outlets. And, um, and of course, our showing on August 14th. It's a, gr it's a great story. Uh, we talked a lot about the train, but the train is kind of the, the object of beauty, but the story really is about uh, shared dreams and desires. And uh, without giving away the whole plot that we that we uncovered and, and kind of laid out in this film, uh, that's that's really what the story is. It's about people. It's about people that share this dream of getting this train somehow up and running from Frank through Alice to Dale to the folks in Maine, Harry Percival um, and Jason LaMontagne. Uh, there's there's a whole bunch of people involved and a whole bunch of stories that intertwine and all kind of come together at one point and make the thing really happen. And, and that, that's, I think, something that people would really enjoy. And, and of course, now the, the train from you know, 1891 is up there, the centerpiece of the Wiscasset Waterville and Farmington Railway Museum in Alma, Maine, and it's running all the time. We, we've been on it. That's kind of, that's how we started by, by going up and, and getting a ride um, and seeing a look on Dale's face. Dale climbed all over this thing when he was a kid. He, he grew up on the farm in summers. He was there every summer working with Alice. and. Uh, he was able to get it done. It's uh, it's a pretty amazing story. So I hope people will, will come and enjoy the film, and uh, I, th I think that uh, that we're, we're going to have a good turnout. So looking forward to seeing everybody. I look forward to seeing the film myself and your passion, both of your passions for the history uh, of the uh, train, for the people involved, and uh, Blair. I had no idea that you had a personal family investment in this as well. It's not just work for you. This was a labor of love and, and that showed. So thank you both for doing this. And I don't want to spoil any more. I appreciate you coming on here with the 98.9 Nash Icon. Thank you. Thanks thank for having you. me.